Meeting live from the International Federation of Studios, the International Institute of Metabolic Medicine, Baja Mexico. The theme of today's IBCR is the first hot topics of the Institute of Medicine. And we will feature experts on the majority and from Arkansas, Louisiana, Washington, Massachusetts, and California in the United States. We'd like to have some video communication, speech and face to face with us, and search, very at means for setting up and deploying this way to schedule online. We would also like to thank our platinum sponsors, Lexington Medical, Medtronic, Fulbright Medical, and the College of Surgery, Easy Search, Critical, David Medical, Mind Ray, Panther Healthcare. Our gold sponsors, Fit For Me, Arthrex, Striker, Advanced Medical Solutions, Liquid Band Fix A, WL Gore, Bariatric Solutions. Our silver sponsor, USGI Medical. Our bronze sponsor, Intuitive Surgical, Boringer Laboratories, Baxter, Apollo Endosurgery. This is the 62nd webinar of the IBC Oxford Academic Series that has over 3 million unique downloads and is streaming live to millions of viewers from over 200 countries and territories through the IBC website, ibcclub.org, the IBC YouTube channel, Facebook Live to the IBC Facebook page, IBC Instagram, the IBC Twitter feed, and LinkedIn. This event is organized by Mr. Harris Kwaja, consultant bariatric surgeon, co-founder of the IBC and director of IBC Global Education based at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, Imperial College London and Christchurch, Oxford University. This event will be chaired by Dr. Josh Roller from Arkansas, United States, and will be moderated by Dr. Alana Chalk from Washington, United States, Dr. Osama Damra from Amman, Jordan, and Dr. Helmuth Billy from California, United States. My chair today is Dr. Josh Roller from Arkansas, United States. Dr. Roller is founder and CEO and minimally invasive bariatric surgeon, Roller Weight Loss and Advanced Surgery in Fayetteville, Arkansas, United States. I will now pass it on to Dr. Roller to introduce our moderators. Thank you for that um, welcome. I uh, This will be a great uh, topic, something that is should be of interest to all of us bariatric surgeons because we so heavily depend on stapling devices. Um, and there's a new one out. Um, we're gonna put it under the microscope today. So I will get right to it and I introduce the moderators for this session. And um, Dr. Elena Chalk is co-owner and bariatric surgeon at Northwest Weight and Wellness Center. That's a private clinic in Washington State. Uh, she's also the medical director of Providence Hospital in Washington State and past president of the Washington State Bariatric Chapter. Dr. Osama Damra from Jordan is a consultant upper GI and hepatobiliary uh, pancreatic surgeon at the Arab Medical Center in Amman, Jordan. And then Dr. Helmuth Billy, we all know him. I've yet to meet him in person, but we've had quite a few conversations in particular about this topic. Um, he's the president of the ASMBS California chapter and a bariatric surgeon at um, Advanced uh, Ventura Advanced Surgical Associates in California. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Chalk to introduce our first speaker and subject. Thank you, Dr. Roller. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. All right. Well, thanks for this opportunity. I'm um, really excited to participate in this and hear what our speakers have to say today and learn a little bit more uh, about the um, Eon Stapler. So uh, with um, no further delays, I wanted to introduce Dr. Tom Lavin. He founded the Surgical Specialist of Louisiana in two, the year 2000, developing it to become one of the leading surgical weight loss programs in the United States, as well as a medical tourism destination for patients worldwide. He was notably uh, the primary clinical investigator in the Pose Essential trial as well. And this was one of the first FDA trials designed to evaluate weight loss using an incisionless surgical platform. He will be speaking today about the anatomy of the Eon stapler and cartridge system. Dr. Lavin. 
And <laughs> thank you, Dr. Chalk. Um, yes, uh, my name is Tom Lavin. Uh, I um, have been uh, practicing bariatrics for over 20 years uh, based out of the New Orleans and have a seven person group that has been together pretty much for that entire time. Um, I, we traditionally use the Ethicon stapler for many years. I proctored and consulted for uh, Ethicon as well as uh, we were involved in uh, research trials and then three years ago, began using the Eon stapler uh, from Lexington Medical um, based on one of my partners, uh, Dr. Redman, had started and was getting great results. So we started using it and have been very happy with it. And I'll go into um, you know, our experience. We were also the co-investigator. I was co-investigator of the hemostasis trial that we'll get into in uh, just a bit. So once again, there's seven of us down in New Orleans have been doing bariatrics for uh, just over 20 years down here. Um, let me get into, here we go. So there, there's my group. And uh, once again, we, we um, have been at this for about uh, a little over 20 years. I've performed over 6,000 bariatric surgeries. Don't really know my total at this point, but we're very busy uh, bariatrics, uh, bar uh, laparoscopic bariatric, as well as endoluminal uh, uh, GI practice. Getting into the anatomy of the Eon uh, stapler, they have some unique proprietary features that I will talk about. Um, first, uh, you can see the the stapler, and for those that haven't used it, there's an articulation that's very precise, it's smooth, and it's not preformed. So you can uh, create the angle exactly that you want. Uh, the um, the I-beam assembly uh, allows it to articulate how you want, and the anvil um, provides very well-shaped staples and a very uh, nice staple line that we'll get into uh, some pictures on that that I think resulted in a very positive hemostasis study. Um, the single-handed grasper uh, was one I'm of the- I'm sorry to inter interrupt Dr. Lavin. I believe we're not seeing your, um, your slides. Oh, you're not. Okay, no, can you please share your screen? Yep, I'm gonna go right now. Sorry, I thought it was- Sorry coming. about that. Sorry, I already thought I had, uh, okay. Go back to the beginning. Do you see, see Zoom, your Zoom screen? There it is, okay. Slides. Okay, wonderful. Play from start. I'm looking for the Zoom screen. I'm going down to bring you back up. And- mm -hmm. uh, Camera, green. Um, sure. I'm sorry, yeah. Blue. Can you see now? No, you need to go to Zoom. Okay. Uh, sorry, just to your that. Zoom screen. Okay. Do you do you see me? I see you. Okay. Perfect. You're sharing now. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Great. Go back to the beginning. Uh, Play from start. Okay. Can you Wonderful. see it now? Thank you. Yes. Great. Okay. I will start uh, once again. And um, 
Once again, I'm going to cover the anatomy of the Eon Stapler. Uh, my name is Tom Lavin. I have a seven member group based out of New Orleans and we've been practicing bariatrics and endoluminal surgery since um, 2000. <clears throat> Getting in uh, prior to using the Eon Stapler, we used the Ethcon Stapler and had been involved in proctoring and consulting and uh, doing research for Ethcon. About three years ago, we started using the Eon stapler and we're very happy with our results as well as the responsiveness of uh, Lexington Medical to our suggestions along the way. And I'll get into some of that. Um, I was a co-investigator with my group in the hemostasis study that we will also get into in just a bit. Um, getting into the anatomy of the Eon stapler, they have uh, some proprietary features, basically the S3 engineering that allows you to articulate exactly without any uh, preset uh, shape that, or articulation that you need to do. They have a single hand grasper that was one of our, our feedback to them initially uh, the, the grasper needed two hands to disengage and, and close the stapler and fire it. We said, you really need to be able to do this with one hand. And uh, the company was um, very responsive. They uh, developed this single-handed grasper that I can both close, open, and fire with uh, a single uh, single hand, which we felt was very, very important in uh, laparoscopic surgery. Uh, in addition to, um, in addition to that, they have multiple tips. This has also been their responsiveness to the market. The short tip that you can see on the right is brand new and they're the only company that offer this. And they basically took advice uh, and feedback from their end user. Uh, this short tip is very important at the angle of hiss. Um, a lot of people felt that the longer uh, tip um, would uh, potentially injure the, the spleen and create problems at the angle of hiss, uh, as well as the colorectal surgeons and the uh, the uh, bariatric docs doing the Sadie also felt it was important uh, with the duodenal dissection. <clears throat> so that, uh, that just shows more responsiveness to the market and uh, the three different tips. The curved tip, I believe uh, they use in thoracic surgery um, that uh, we'll get in the registry uh, coming up on that. They also have a multi-gear that we feel is very, very important. Uh, one of the things that we, we had uh, looked at when we were using the Ethicon stapler is the pulse firing, which really you know, slows down the firing and allows for better hemostasis. And uh, Lexington Medical has actually incorporated that in their stapler with this multi-gear firing uh, that basically allows for a 50% lower firing force, kind of like downshifting on a bike when you're going uphill. And we, we use it on every firing where it's a very slow, methodical, easy firing. We think that addition to the uh, excellent staple formation uh, gives you very good hemostasis, superior to the competitors as we'll get into. This um, slide shows uh, the wide range of staples consistent with uh, the competitors going from gray to the black for the very thick tissue. On our sleeve gastrectomies, we will use one purple and four orange traditionally and vary that if the tissue is thicker. Um, you can see the staple formations going from the thin uh, tissue of 3.5 millimeters up to 4.5. And you can see that the delta between the Lexington uh, Eon stapler 
at 88% perfect beef formation to um, much lower for the competitors uh, increases as you go to thicker tissue, which once again, we feel is an advantage and we've seen it clinically in our patients. We, we did a, a hemostasis study uh, using a third party blinded uh, person to evaluate and rate the actual bleeding from the staple line that we uh, photographed during the, the cases. And there was uh, significant uh, superiority uh, with uh, the Eon stapler as opposed to the Ethicon stapler uh, in this study. And once again, we feel it's due to the, the um, both uh, better uh, formation of the staples and staple line, as well as the, the pulse firing uh, uh, feature of the, the stapler. This is the registry that uh, Lexin Medical has that uh, is continually updated daily and today has 17,000 bariatric procedures loaded in and uh, they actually have an extra 5,000 that are done outside this registry for uh, colorectal surgery and thoracic. So it's used well beyond the bariatric uh, market but this uh, gives constant transparent feedback to all the end users that have questions or want to know um, about other trends going on and what other bariatric surgeons are doing uh, uh, um, out in the market. And in uh, conclusion, um, you know, we, I've been up to the site, the um, research, uh, uh, facilities in, in Boston, and they're amazing in that they give, uh, they want to know what we need, they want to know our evaluation of their product, and they're constantly working to improve the product as well as listening to us, the end user, which I find um, very valuable. And as I said before, we, we have given feedback that we've seen in uh, pretty quick uh, fashion as far as a product that is better for us. And that was something that we didn't traditionally get from uh, other, uh, other uh, products uh, and companies. So, um, so the, that, is, uh, that concludes my uh, presentation and why we're very happy with this product. And most of our group is now using it uh, in, uh, in our practice in New Orleans. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lavin. That was great. Um, we're going to do a few questions here. And one of my questions for you is, I know in our experience using it, the force to fire is, is a lot less, especially in that low gear mode. How, does your, how do you feel about that? And how does your group feel about that as far as kind of wear and tear and stress on your hands and wrists? Yeah, we find it, uh, once you, like you said, very low force. And I use that low force on every firing uh, just because I have no reason not to. So it certainly uh, is not, um, you know, no wear and tear on the hand. I know they are looking at and there is a, um, a mechanical uh, electric uh, stapler coming. But uh, once again, right now, it is not very difficult to use at all. Great. Let's see, Dr. Chalk or Dr. Uh, Billy, you guys have any questions? Yeah, I had a yeah. question, Dr. Lavin. Um, what product were you using before, and did you change your technique at all for the better hemostasis? Did you stop over sewing or stop using um, seam guard material or anything like that? No, I didn't change my technique at all. I would say, though, when we always evaluate the staple line, and at times when I wasn't happy with the staple line, I would over sew it. Um, but I've never you, I haven't, not never, but it's been 15 years since I've used any product like glue or seam guard. Um, I, I do over sew the proximal. Um, 
10 centimeters uh, from the angle of his on all patients have been doing that for 10, 12 years. I didn't change that at all. So I really didn't change my technique at all other than I felt the staple line was better and certainly hemostasis is notably better. Tom, I have a question. Uh, there seems to be a, a more diverse selection of cartridges with orange, uh, short tip, um, they're black and purple are slightly different than the manufacturer you used previously. Um, what do you have to say about the wider selection of cartridges or, you know, some people are starting to say, oh, they use all whites. What's your feeling about staple line heights and staple line formation as it applies to the cartridge selection you have available? Uh, I did not change uh, the size. They do have a wide variety. I, when I switched over from Ethicon, which has been a little over three years, I, I went with the same size staple. Like I said, I used the purple and then four oranges in general. Uh, if I feel like it's much thicker tissue, I will use a black initially and sometimes two purple. So I really try to make it uh, customized to, to the patient um, based on the thickness of the tissue. Uh, so I hope that answers your question, Helmut. Did you notice there's a big subjective conversation that goes on all the time anecdotally about staple line bleeding? And since you kept the cartridges the same, did you consistently see an improvement in the dryness of the staple line that may be correlated with how well the bee is formed? No question about that. I mean, it almost sounds like salesman-y but until you actually use this stapler right with the competitor's uh, stapler, it is a notable difference. Um, and you, you'll see it case to case. And I've even brought it up to the Ethicon people and they, they don't really contest it. Uh, uh, but there, there's a notable dis difference with the same size stapler. Yeah, I think there's a drive from competitors to, to go down a staple height for every load. Um, that's what my Ethicon rep is telling me I should downsize versus what I was doing before. Um, and I think that has to do with uh, bleeding. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> Dr. Domra, did you have a question? Uh, excuse me, other than the visual inspection of the stable line, have you looked uh, through your data to see your, your reoperation for bleeding, drain output, uh, uh, blood transfusion? Only anecdotal. We haven't looked at, uh, which takes a lot of numbers. And uh, so anecdotally, yes. But as far as something I could really say, um, as far as a study, no, we, we haven't looked at it. Personally, as a surgeon, where I only care about no complications, I feel very comfortable with this stapler, and I'm not changing under any circumstances. Well, for a lot of us private practice surgeons, um, finding time to publish papers uh, is difficult, especially when you're, you're busy operating all day. So anecdotally, it means a lot to, to guys like us and, and guys and girls. So uh, with that said... Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Domrod to introduce someone who I know very well, and I would introduce him, but I don't want to be biased, but I've known Dr. Kwan now for 11 years and good friend and one of my partners. So, Dr. Domrod, you're up. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Young Wan is a minimally invasive and pediatric surgeon at Solar Wake Loss and Advanced Surgery in Arkansas, USA. And he will present us with the Aeon Stabler and Laparoscopy Crew and Y Gastric Bypass tips, tricks, and outcomes, if you please. All right, so let me share the screen here. Just wanna make sure everybody can see that screen, okay? Yes, good, thank you. Okay, there we go. So uh, I'd like to thank all of you uh, viewers and uh, for attending this webinar. Um, also like to thank the IBC for the invitation. Um, but for the next few minutes, I'll be discussing uh, with you my experience with the Eon stapler as it relates to uh, laparoscopic Roux and Y gastric bypass 
And it is my hope uh, that you can maybe find this presentation practical and helpful and take away uh, a thing or two uh, from it. Just a few words about me. I'm a minimally invasive bariatric and general surgeon. I trained, uh, had the great fortune of training in Seattle, Washington. Dr. Chalk probably knows all about that area. Uh, I, I did my medical school there, went to, had my general surgery training there at the University of Washington, and then did my fellowship in minimally invasive surgery there. And when I was done, I joined uh, Dr. Roller uh, back in 2011. Uh, and just a disclosure here is that I, I had an advisory role at uh, Lexington uh, Medical. Since that time of joining Josh, I've been blessed to have completed just shy of uh, 3,000 bariatric uh, surgeries, uh, about 1,900 of which uh, were gastric bypasses. Um, and so that's just a little bit about me. So uh, I'm just like everybody else in this webinar in that I've tried uh, multiple uh, different stapler uh, sort of surgical staplers throughout my career, starting with my training. Uh, most recently, though, for about the past nine months or so, uh, I've been using the Lexington Eon uh, stapler. And as you can see on the slide, in the past nine months, I've done about 430 bariatric cases and fired it about 3,100 uh, plus times. About two thirds of those cases were doing, you know, switches, about a quarter gastric bypass, and the others were sleeve gastrectomy and revisions and some of the other uh, procedures. Here, I'm just kind of going over it real quick because we just went over it, uh, but the technical specifications of the Eon reloads, uh, every day, every case sort of options are mainly the middle three that you see there, the white, the orange, and the purple load. Uh, I've used black a few times here and there on revisions for extra thick tissues, um, but the three options for everyday use is really nice in that the white is really reserved uh, in my mind for small bowel of normal or thin caliber. Um, and uh, you have two choices uh, for thicker tissues. And so uh, orange and purple. Now you can see that the orange about 50% um, taller than the white as is 1.5 millimeters tall compared to one. And the purple is just a little bit taller than that. So the delta between orange and purple is not as big as white and orange. Uh, but the purple uh, is about 1.8 millimeters tall. And I find it clinically significant, um, certainly anecdotally, uh, when using orange versus white. And I'll talk about that in just a second through video as well. Uh, but I do think that when chosen correctly, the white can give us a little bit better hemostasis. And certainly on the stomach, orange gives me a little bit better um, hemostasis than purple when chosen appropriately. So per gastric bypass, this is sort of my reload utilization. You'll see that I use whites and then I use more orange than purple. Pretty much the only time I use a purple is my sort of the very first transverse uh, sort of firing for beginning of the uh, pouch formation. I use the purple there, but even then uh, on some certainly female patients with lower BMI, if I feel as though the stomach is not as thick, um, you can get that tactile feedback. And in those cases, I've used orange and seen uh, excellent sort of hemostasis uh, and really uh, improvement on uh, staple line bleeding compared to the stapler that I was using before, uh, which was Medtronic. Um, and I also uh, will show you here. So, so changing gears a little bit to sort of technical discussions about the surgery for my ruin Y gastric bypass, um, probably like most of you, I start uh, with the gastro jejunal uh, jejunostomy. Uh, my biliary pancreatic limb is 40 centimeters distal to the ligament of trites. My RU limb then is 150 centimeters. Um, and I'll do the white load once fire, 60 millimeter anastomosis there. I really haven't had any issues with stricture at the jejunal jejunostomy in the past. And so uh, a six centimeter anastomosis with the white load is, is, is great there. And I use the uh, close the common enterotomy using either the white or the orange load. It's mostly orange load, but in some cases in some sort of thinner small bowel, uh, I've seen, I've used whites and they've also been very helpful. But let me show you uh, before we go there to the video, just a really quick reminder, the difference between white and the orange there, as far as a staple height of 50%. Uh, one is for white one millimeter and 1.5 for the orange. And uh, let me show you the video here. So uh, this is, we're at about 40 centimeters distal to the ligament of trites. And we'll go ahead and uh, place our stapler. The uh, anvil fits very nicely there. It's very smooth going through. 
And then you'll see an excellent sort of staple line here. And I'm using, just like Dr. Labin talked about, I'm also using that low gear pretty much with every firing um, and good staple line, uh, hemostatic staple line there. And once the bowel is lined up for the anastomosis, you'll see that we put the white load there and it just very smoothly, uh, I don't think that's a short amble, but it goes in uh, very nicely uh, with a six centimeter anastomosis uh, there. And you'll see that I use um, the uh, orange stapler here, orange load to close the common enterotomy um, here as I line it up. And this is how we uh, staple close the uh, common enterotomy. And there's another video uh, to follow. Again, you'll see orange load is used. Um, we'll just show you the staple line once again here up top. Uh, excellent staple line with good hemostasis. This is my partner, Dr. Roller. Uh, he'll use sort of the same technique just to kind of show you again um, how nicely the staple stapler is inserted into the small bowel. I don't know why his is bleeding a little bit more. He just, maybe it's technical issues, but. That's, that's, just, that's just a joke. I got to throw in a zinger in there for him. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it works nicely. He'll also use the orange here um, to complete the common enterotomy here. Once he's done with that. Um, and so as far as uh, the next steps I do is I pretty much uh, divide the greater momentum um, every time. I do this every time and I find it helpful to be able to reach uh, the pouch and fashion my roux in anti-gastric, anti-colic, uh, anti-gastric way there. Um, and regarding the gastric pouch, I'll typically use three total firings of 60 millimeter cartridges, one transverse and two vertical. Uh, and the reload heights really depend on uh, how I feel the tissue is uh, between orange or purple. I don't think it's, uh, as far as leaks and such go, I don't think it's life or death as far as uh, between the two when it comes to the stomach, but I do think that there is a better hemostasis when chosen correctly when using the orange load. And I'll show you some videos here. So this is me. Uh, usually after that second vessel appear, I'll fire my transverse first load there, but this is a purple load firing um, of six centimeters. And again, uh, staple. I've been very, very pleased with the staple line and the hemostasis, um, as you are seeing here. And then I'll, as we go up more proximal to the stomach, I find it thinner. So for me, I will use my orange load here uh, with, again, excellent staple line hemostasis, as you'll see. So I'm using the low gear. So you're having to fire it a few more times, but again, you know, um, the firing force is, uh, is, is very, very low. This is my uh, last firing, and I would normally divide that with scissors at the end. And this is uh, my partner, Dr. Roller. Uh, he'll use his purple here, and you'll see a little bit of difference here is that he'll use a purple load for the first uh, firing, and then he elects to uh, keep going with the purple. Um, and I think that's perfectly fine. Like I said, I don't, in my experience, uh, uh, that really hasn't had anything to do, that hasn't really shown in any leaks or anything like that because we really haven't had any, had any uh, but it does uh, prevent some um, staple line bleeding in my mind at times. And I'll show you an example of um, a different kind of firing here for me. Um, this, I felt as though this was a little bit thinner, so I did use orange for my first transverse load here, as you can see. Um, so it really depends on, I feel as though how, how thick the tissue is. Um, and I'll go through uh, the rest of this uh, gastric pouch formation with uh, orange load as well. And it's been, uh, like I said, I've been very impressed with the stapling system and the reloads uh, and how hemostatic they have been as you're seeing in this uh, picture. I didn't go through a whole file of many different videos. We, de we decided to go ahead and take some videos one day and here it is. So this is sort of what we see every day. And the last firing there with 
uh, that I'm doing here would be uh, with orange as well. Okay. I just want to also emphasize, just show you the, the staple line here as well, very hemostatic, even way up top using that orange load. So um, as far as my gastrojejunostomy, like I talked about a second ago, anti-colic, anti-gastric, and I use a 30 millimeter white load, uh, as you'll see here in just a second. Uh, and I closed the common enterotomy. I adopted uh, Dr. Roller's uh, method of running it single layer uh, and leaving it like that. Um, and finally, we'll do the saline insufflation test. I'm sure as most of you do there. And so here is a 30 millimeter uh, white uh, cartridge. I'll just kind of dilate the end of the roux uh, there with the anvil. We'll go in with a three centimeter cartridge there. It's nice and small and cute. And so we're gonna go in there and uh, I've already made a gastrotomy. Uh, and so with a little bit of maneuvering, we'll get inside uh, the pouch and we'll go ahead and make this firing. Uh, I do mine just a little shy of uh, three uh, centimeters. So it's probably right around 29, uh, 28 millimeters there. And uh, my partner, uh, he, Dr. Roller does a, uh, a little bit smaller anastomosis, I think, but here's his video, kind of the same thing. He gets into that pouch much easier, as you'll see, there he goes, and um, pulls it back a little bit, and he'll do about, I'm gonna say about 25, 26 millimeters there. And it, it shows great uh, hemostasis. And this is a picture, this is a video of me doing a gastrojejunostomy. As far as tips and tricks, uh, I found this to be very helpful. Learned this from uh, Josh is, this is a handle stitch. Uh, so I always place it first and go lateral. So outside of the, um, the common enterotomy there. And so I'll tie this down and it really helps me to bring forward um, the basically the field that needs to be uh, closed with my suture. And by bringing it forward and be able to do that, I think that it really helps with the anastomosis. And so what I'm using here is a V-lock suture. It's a barbed suture. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. It basically allows for sustained tension as well as uh, even distribution of tension. Uh, and it basically takes away the need for the assistant to hold uh, perfect tension. Uh, we're able to do that because it's barbed and it only moves one way only. Um, and so I just run this as pictured here. After I do my first throw, I'll go ahead and grab my handle stitch over here and I'll bring it forward. Um, and I found that to be really helpful rather than have it sort of continue to be dragged back, especially on bigger patients. And I think it's also very important that the assistant uh, be able to lay the suture down uh, with precision. Uh, and my physician's assistant is doing a nice job laying down the sutures uh, so that it's evenly distributed.
And then with this suture, uh, you actually don't even have to tie it at the end. Um, play it there and we'll leave a little bit of tail. I go all the way over um, to where we were with uh, very close to the um, handle stitch. And we'll lay it down and that's where um, we're done with our gastrodigenostomy, just like that. So uh, as far as uh, my experience with the Eon um, stapler, we started uh, back in June of 2021. So it's been about nine months now. And uh, for me personally, I've done about 430 cases since that time, equals to about 3,100 firing. That includes 100 gastric bypasses uh, during that time. We as a group have done uh, right at about 1,000 cases since then, uh, since June of last year. Uh, I've had, had I've had one leak. Um, this was a, a black load firing uh, on an eroded band that I could not move. I could not take out endoscopically because it was stuck to a ring of tissue. So I did have to make a gastrotomy to get the band out uh, and convert this patient to a gastric bypass on the same setting. Um, and other than that, as far as staple line bleeding, I know uh, that was asked by Dr. Billy earlier. Uh, but as far as needing transfusions or reoperations, we've had none since using uh, this stapler. Uh, what I like about Aon personally for me is the favorable features uh, really include uh, the choices between loads, right? I mean, I do not like bleeding staple lines. How about you? Like, I, I just don't like it. And uh, since using this, I think uh, uh, I really found it to be really hemostatic. Um, and uh, you really, don't realize the practical significance of this until I started using the orange load on slightly thinner stomach and noticed that this yielded better hemostasis, at least for me. Another nice feature is the freedom of articulation. Dr. Lavin talked about that. And really this is a bird's eye view of the lever uh, and it's not preset. So you can always sort of continue to articulate uh, to, your, uh, to your liking. So it's very precise. And the firing gear, as we talked about, uh, here's a standard and here's thick. We always, I personally always bring it over to thick uh, no matter where I'm, where I'm at. And uh, firing has, it's, it's almost comparable to a, um, a power stapler in that it really reduces, uh, power stapler reduces the amount of force that it takes obviously to, to fire it but you have some control over the rate of firing and such, but it's, at least the firing force goes, it's impressive how much it takes down. As we talked about excellent hemostasis, and uh, I've also had the great uh, privilege of uh, visiting the uh, Lexington Medical Facility in Bedford, uh, just close to Boston. And they really make this with robotic precision, but there is a layers, many layers of human verification process that was really impressive. So to recap, jejunal jejunostomy, I do it with a 60 millimeter white load and the common uh, enterotomy closure is done mostly with orange, but sometimes white. I think having that choice is very nice. And for me, I always uh, try to do the anti-colic, anti-gastric uh, rule in as it proves to be uh, a lot more efficient in my mind. And uh, as far as gastro uh, it's linear. Uh, when I was training, we were doing it retrogastric, retrocolic, and a lot of times using the circular stapler. Uh, but I think that in where we are in private practice and uh, with the number of patients as well, not sacrificing uh, com sort of complication rates short or long-term, we just cut down in the operating time in my mind um, with the linear as well as uh, anti-colic, anti-gastric approach. And the handle stitch, again, if you haven't used it, I think it's very helpful. And a uh, single layer common enterotomy closure there for the gastrodigenostomy. Uh, I was very scared at first, I'll be honest. Uh, before adopting uh, Josh's uh, method there. I thought it was madness. You, you do one single layer and then you don't even tie it at the end. Uh, but I think it's proven over and over again uh, in my 1900 bariatric uh, sort of gastric bypasses that it does not uh, have anything to do with leaks at that point. Thank you for your attention. All right, nice presentation. So, uh, one a comment and then a question. One of the things that we noticed when we were doing our JJs um, in the beginning was it was a little bit harder to get the stapler in. So we had them compare the stapler we were using with Medtronic, their white load versus the Aon stapler when it was closed, but how wide 
open the gap still was. And it was just a little bit wider. So we took it to, to the company and said, listen, we need to, we need to get this stapler closed tighter when it's, you know, before firing, when we're trying to get it into our inner automobiles. we don't want to change our technique. And so they, they took that and six weeks later, they had fixed it and sent us new white loads to use. And so one of the things about, I think sometimes these companies get so big, there's no agility, there's no nimbleness. They can't just make a, what seems to us as a surgeon to be a simple change and that happened really quickly. And then another uh, change I saw, I've seen, and Quan, you can comment on this, is the, that new 30 millimeter white load. And how, how has that helped you on your gastric agenostomies? Yeah, I think it's really helped with, especially um, larger patients when their BMI is sort of, you know, high 40s to 50s, uh, getting that up there with the rule limb, you know, you have, I almost feel like, you know, tension free, but you don't want to mess around with having somebody else help you to undress the bowel off the stapler and such. And so I think that that really helps out with the surgeon. Again, another key that key change that they've made to make it more um, friendly, user friendly uh, for, uh, for the surgeons. Go ahead, Dr. Damra. Uh, I, I can't agree more. We've actually started doing uh, using Lexington for sleeps, and then we moved for who and why gastric bypass. We have done around 200 to 300 so far. And I have to say we had no issues whatsoever. I was initially very scared to get an upper GI bleeding. You know, to, when you in a sleep, you can actually see the step line in a bypass. You have it enter luminous, and I don't know sometimes what happened. So actually, we had no problems whatsoever. So we the orange reload to do the gastrogenostomy. Uh, and I agree totally. Have you had any cases of upper GI bleeding? I'm sorry, what was the question? Have you had any case of upper GI bleeding? Secondary oh, with the gastrogenostomy? No, I yes. have not. Yes, we have with the same. I agree. I can't agree more. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Chuck. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Khan, for your uh, great talk. I've learned a couple things. One is that I need to be invited to Boston because it sounds like <laughs> <laughs> I used to work there. So, Leon. <laughs> <laughs> um, and two, I didn't even know there was a 30 centimeter stapler. That's fantastic. Um, so that's great. I'm curious as to why you use a white load for your JJ to create your enterotomy, and then you potentially switch to an orange load. It's still small bowel. Why do you do that? Yeah, right there. Um, I feel as though just right at the top of there, uh, we are joining the two. And so sometimes it can get really thick. Um, so white seems to be pushing at a time. So I typically use orange there because you're using those to really close that, um, the common enterotomy that's involved with two, uh, coming, joining together. So I feel as though that fits a little bit too snug with the white most of the time and orange has been really helpful. Dr. Billy. A quick question. Um, it seems that all of us have had no problem switching from powered uh, handles to a mechanical handle. It seems to be around the uh, force of fire of the gear. Um, without having to use powers, which have batteries or uh, things that require more care, uh, have you noticed any economic change in a high volume practice like yours uh, with respect to going back to mechanical handles versus missing the luxury of a powered handle. Tremendous uh, difference there as far as economically, um, as far as reloads and such. I just think that, you know, I agree with you, Dr. Billy, in that when you fire these, when you have that much lowered, um, you know, firing force, it really takes away that big emphasis on the powered and the and economically, I think you, you make a lot of savings uh, going to mechanical. Not that that's the primary reason, but I think it, 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 it definitely needs to be computed in the calculation for sure. Well, there's no doubt that that low gear firing very much mimics the powered stapler. I don't, I don't use powered staplers. Um, I like to go faster than that. Uh, so 
but that low fire gear is a nice combo or intermediate between going that slow and not using anything. So we've not noticed any any change. And uh, Dr. Kwan used a lot of powered stapling before this. And uh, to see him change back to mechanical handles um, is very interesting. Yeah, I was using the Signia quite a bit uh, before then, but uh, I think that with lowering the, uh, again, the firing force, I think it made a big difference. All right, in the interest of time, Dr. Bill, you wanna introduce our last speaker? Yes, absolutely. Uh, this is Dr. Giannis Raftopoulos, uh, quite an experienced surgeon, both academically and, uh, and in private practice. He's authored over 100 peer-reviewed publications, currently the Director of Bariatric Surgery at Holyoke Medical Center in Massachusetts and also the Athens Euro Clinic in Greece, so perhaps we can get an international uh, uh, opinion. But the topic is very nice, de novo reflux after laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. Could this be a technical problem? So uh, please welcome Dr. Raftopoulos for this interesting talk. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Thank you for the invitation and the good words. Uh, I guess I get the difficult and more challenging uh, topic. A um, uh, little bit of my background. Uh, I am a bariatric surgeon for about 20 years. Uh, I ran uh, a bariatric program at the uh, Holyoke Medical Center in Massachusetts. Um, I have extensive experience with uh, gastric bypass revisions and sleep gastrectomy primarily. And uh, uh, just one disclosure related to the uh, presentation is uh, I have uh, done funded research for uh, E.ON. Um, and a few things about my back background with uh, Les Intermedical. I came across about, I think, two and a half years ago, um, a common friend uh, who I was working with, uh, with a gas balloon company, introduced me to Less medical. I, I, I researched it. Uh, I found it very interesting uh, and great similarities with the um, Metronics table, which I use at the time. Um, and, you know, we started using it empirically in the beginning. I was very happy with the initial experience. And then we decided to conduct a randomized trial in a similar fashion like Dr. Lavin did with comparing uh, Eon stable with the uh, Ethicon stable. We did the same thing with Metronic. And we used uh, 60 patients randomized in two groups. Uh, one uh, group uh, underwent the surgery with the Eon and the other group uh, with the uh, endo GI tie stable, uh, uh, stable from, uh, uh, from Medronics. Um, we had an outside surgeon to uh, independently evaluate all the endoscopic and laparoscopic tissues we obtained. And uh, we found that there was significant difference in uh, obvious bleeding points uh, between the two staples. Uh, the pictures were obtained just after completion of the staple line before we had to do any clipping or anything else. And there was an obvious difference that was almost uh, evenly distributed throughout the staple line. Uh, and I kind of echo exactly what the previous speakers uh, said. Uh, there's definitely a significant difference in the dryness of the staple lines. And, uh, and I think makes the surgery easier, reduces the time of having to deal with bleedings. And, I believe uh, it takes away completely the need of any reinforcements of the state line, other than, you know, occasional bleeding point that you have to secure with a simple clip. So definitely, I believe there is a difference um, uh, in 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 the uh, in the bleeding at least between the uh, the different staplers. Um, I have done hand, several hundred surgeries since then with uh, the Eon stapler. I haven't had any significant bleedings or any other complications, um, and I believe it's uh, superior uh, from the other staplers. Uh, and I also find very easy to use. Uh, I like very much the, the fact that you can articulate smoothly without specific points of articulation. Uh, makes it very uh, beneficial when you have a, a sharp angle near the G junction or during the bypass of the sleeve. Um, and, uh, and also, so, um, I believe there's a difference in hemostasis because the orange law, which is the one that primarily uses everyone else, uh, the staple height is slightly less than the blue laws of Ethicon or the um, um, endogia tri stable. And I believe that difference uh, does make a difference in, in, in most of us. It seems that this might be the ideal 
stabler for more stomachs. And, and I think the three rows of the same equal height stabler also makes a difference between having uh, variable heights uh, between the three rows of, of stable lines. So of course, that's not exactly the, the, the talk of today, but I want to just uh, share my experience with the, with the Eon. Uh, so um, reflex is a big issue with laparoscopic surgery. We all know that. Uh, the instance varies in different studies, but it's as high as 30 to 60%. There is a slight difference between uh, existing reflex that persisting and also the novel reflex, which is reflex basically that the patient starts experiencing after the operation, which is also high as high as 50%. There's significant association with sophagitis up to 41% and parity sophagus up to 18%. And it appears, unfortunately, that the reflex incidence uh, is probably the highest in, among all bariatric procedures, including the lab band. So it is a problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, what are the causes? Well, hiatal hernias is one thing that has been you know, widely discussed in the past. Uh, there is a significant discrepancy between surgeons uh, sensitivity, so to speak, uh, or threshold to repair hernias or not. Um, there have been studies that basically show that if you do a higher hernia repair along with the slip gastrectomy, it can increase the risk of reflux up to 68%. But also there are studies that state that the de novo reflux did not improve with repairing the higher hernias. And you get into a risk of getting a higher hernia recurrence, so sometimes can be even more significant than the original hernia. So there are downsides of doing that. Another issue that I have seen, particularly when I do revisions of, of sleeve gastrectomies from other practices, is that uh, the caliber of the, of the sleeve is not even, and especially near the G-junction, which can be more difficult and more challenging to make the sleeve even. Many times there is a, an uneven uh, caliber there with, with a retained fundus that is uh, sometimes significant. That is often associated with a missed hiatal hernia, especially if it's a posterior component, and I've seen that a few times. I believe uh, several surgeons do not properly dissect posteriorly all the short gases uh, at the posterior part of the stomach, and that can also affect the ability of, uh, of doing the resection properly. Uh, also, a large fundus, you know, as you have seen all of you, the, the size of the stomach is not the same, and some patients, for whatever reason, they have a very large proximal stomach. And that obviously can make much more challenging and difficult to really properly assess what you have to resect and what you have to leave behind. And that can end up uh, leaving more stomach behind than you want. Uh, many times, I, at least in my practice, I see extensive retrogastric adhesions, sometimes congenital for what, no particular reason, sometimes related to previous operations in the area or uh, for gallbladder surgery. Uh, and I think, and I resect all of them. I, I lice all these adhesions all the way to the lesser curvature. I like the stomach to be completely mobile because even if you think that you have enough room to do your resection, I believe these attachments will end up limiting you in doing the resection properly, leaving more stomach behind, eventually an uneven stomach in certain areas. So that's an important thing. Um, another reason that leads to that is uh, if you don't properly retract the stomach medially and laterally, uh, evenly and from the stable line uh, that you have created or the area of dissection that you did with the uh, uh, harmonic scalpel uh, or the ligature. Um, and uh, also sometimes because most surgeons use the boozy, the geometry of the stomach is, 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 uh, is changing. Uh, every stomach doesn't have the same geometry, doesn't have the same angles or, or sharp lines or curved lines. And when you put the bougie in, you basically straighten a, a, an organ that is not straight. So, and that is an artificial, an artificial manipulation of the stomach. And that can also lead, I believe, sometimes to problems. As the bougie, yes, uh, does reduce the possibility of a major stricture sometimes, but uh, you also have more difficulty assessing the compliance of the stomach wall, which is not the same, and also uh, where exactly the stomach sits, and you can, uh, try to imitate the angles of the stomach and keep that same diameter caliber throughout the staple line and throughout the sleeve. Another issue is the distal stricture, which is a well-known issue. Uh, and that's one of the major issues that I think associated with reflex post operatively uh, And that, as you all know, happens even by using the bougie. I find that if you're using a bougie, you must try to position the bougie all the way to the pylorus and not, uh, sometimes I see videos straight to the greater curvature of the stomach because that can give you a false impression that you are far away from the lesser curvature and you may not. 
and as you and more so using 60 millimeter staples and not 45 millimeter staples, sometimes uh, you can keep the same distance from the laser table shift throughout that length of the staple, especially the longer it is. So another thing I sometimes do, and especially in installs that have a very sharp angle, is I may use uh, um, not cost effective sometimes, but uh, uh, it helps maintain that same caliber throughout the sleeve easier. Uh, with experience, I have to say I have been using less and less 45 staples, but there are instances where I'm not 100% clear uh, about the anatomy or about the, uh, the the distance from the lesser temperature. And I will I will use a 45 because it gives me more flexibility and less concern about narrowing something in the distal tip of the stapler. And I think the importance of, of that and the importance of maintaining the same caliber throughout is it comes from the physics law from poor as you leave, and you can see that the flow throughout the tube uh, is affected by many parameters, but the biggest, the most important ones is the diameter of the tube in the fourth power. So basically differences in diameter inside the sleeve can significantly change the turbulence of the, of the fluid going through the tube that you created. And also uh, from the length of the sleeve, and that's something else I want to discuss. The gastrobexy, the gastrobexy is not widely adapted, although there are several studies now that have uh, used the uh, gastrobexy and have done comparative um, trials with no gastrobexy and they, they, they found a difference uh, in several parameters. I've been in, adopted the gastrobexy for several years uh, as one of the efforts I've made to reduce my issues of sleep in the past. I also have, have started doing it because in many divisions, I've noticed that when I tried to, to dissect the stomach, sometimes the staple line had completely stuck to the undersurface of the left lobe of the liver, completely rotating uh, the staple line, creating like a corkscrew effect in a way. And that was causing like a functional narrowing near the, the uh, incisional angularis, which con was contributing, I believe, to the reflex of the patient. So I thought that, you know, leaving the staple line mobile, although originally the stomach has attachments, it might not be the right thing to do. You know, the stomach probably is not made to have that, that uh, lateral segment uh, free and mobile. You know, there's a reason that there are attachments of the stomach. And I believe re repositioning the stomach back to the uh, greater curvature at the same place where you dissected the, the short uh, cathetic vessels, I believe it does make a difference to align the stomach properly. And, and, and in some cases, actually, uh, you can even see as you complete the sleeve that the stomach is just not sitting right. It's just pulled more medially. It's not completely laid down properly. And I find by doing the gastroplexy, I will position it exactly as I found it, basically. So I do believe that there is a, there is a benefit of that. Uh, it may not be a benefit in every case, but I think it's a good thing to have in mind, and especially in a challenging case or a case that you're just not, not happy with how the stomach is situated. It might be a good thing to use. The short and the tight sleeve. Well, the short sleeve I, I mentioned before, again, through the Poisulis law, the, there is a difference in the uh, flow of the fluid uh, through a tube, depending on the length of that tube. So, so the shorter the length, the higher the flow, and that can create more turbulence again and more reflux. In contrast, when the sleeve is longer, uh, that also uh, can, uh, can control that flow and maybe is contributing to less reflux. So I, I tend to create longer sleeves um, I try to go as close as possible to the pylorus. And uh, you can see at the bottom of the slide, um, I had started recording about two years ago the pathology reports from, from my cases and cases of sleeves that I that came to my practice for follow up or for revision. And interestingly, I did find a difference in the overall length of the specimens. And my specimen length is averaging about 25 centimeters, whereas uh, patients coming to my practice at 18. Uh, and many of these patients had been reporting significant amount of reflux. At the same time, I don't use Buzi anymore for my, for my sleeve gastrectomies. And I found that you know, the, the maximum width of my specimens, I mean, near the uh, obviously G junction, is slightly less than it is from specimens I have, uh, of patients I have got from other practices. But nevertheless, uh, it may be contributing also uh, to the uh, level of reflux, because you know, if you do a very tight sleeve, can also make it very difficult for the patient to comply with directions and properly drink appropriate amounts and eventually eat food. 
And I believe, I always believe that weight loss should, should happen because patients use the procedure to change their habits and not because they are so much restricted from the procedure that they cannot eat or drink properly. And I've, and I've seen this quite a bit with the, with the sleeve and also previously with the band. The H. pylori. The H. pylori is another interesting thing that I have noticed. Uh, we, we do uh, examine for H. pylori preoperatively and we do treat patients and we follow up with another test uh, if it's positive and we try to eliminate it. But there have been occasions where we missed that or patients had two or one or two treatments preoperatively and uh, it persisted. So I decided to proceed with the surgery and I, and I did find the H. pylori on the specimen. And interestingly, when I did uh, endoscopies, uh, you know, Three to six months after surgery, it was a, it was a time that I was I was doing it routinely uh, as a surveillance to see how 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 the sleeves look endoscopically, and I found that for people that had a history of H. pylori present at the time of the surgery, uh, uh, people that we found so on the on the on the endoscopy, sixty percent of them had also a history of H. pylori present, whereas uh, none of these were found in people that had an H. pylori negative. So there might be an association between uh, persistent presence of H. pylori in the stomach and, uh, you know, reflux, esophagitis, and possibly uh, bias. And lastly, and is then obviously the, the X factor, which is the patient, and also the, the practice habits, you know, how the patients are followed, how the patients are, are educated. I find that, you know, especially at the, at the first few months after surgery, the more food is introduced in the patient's diet, the more likely patients report symptoms of reflux. And I think that's natural because Food is what we like to eat, and, and uh, you know it brings errors, it brings mistakes. Uh, it's more difficult to control the portions, and I believe introducing the food later, if possible, or, delay, or, or, or giving the patient specific directions how much food and how often they should be eating actual food might make a difference in the reflux. Um, and also, another common thing I, I, I assess is if someone comes to the practice, even my patients and complain about severe reflux, I usually look and see how they did in terms of weight loss. And I find the significant correlation between poor weight loss and reflux. And part of that is probably wrong eating habits. So sometimes the first thing I will do is to assess the patient's eating habits and try to uh, take them back to the original principles. And many times the reflux will improve. So in terms of the, from the practice perspective, a few recommendations I have you know, learned over time is I, I really spend a lot of time uh, to help the patient understand what the symptoms of reflux are, and also help them associate them on, on live, you know, the time they happen with potentially what they've done before. So many times an episode of reflux, a sudden episode of reflux may be related to what they just ate or what they just drank. And sometimes thinking about through what they did before, it might help them understand what happened and eliminate it from the future. So basically learning and improving your technique of eating and drinking. And I find patients, if you don't tell them that, and if you don't repeat that, they just don't know, they don't know. They just take for granted they're gonna have reflux and they keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again without learning and improving how they need to eat to avoid that. Another important thing is to teach them properly the right pace of drinking and motivate them not to forget about that, at least for the first three months, which is the months that usually uh, things are more tight and more restricted. Uh, we use the 30 ml per 15 minute rule, but in the begin very beginning, I even break this down to a rule of two ml per minute. And I understand that this is difficult to expect that someone will do long term, but the more they could try to do that, the better their experience is, and the more they learn early on how to, how to drink and how to eat long term, which I think acquiring those skills early on might make it less likely to get severe reflux later. Uh, also, the food portion measurement is important. You know. Many times I hear common rules like a small, using a smaller plate or the palm of the hand or the deck of cards or weighing the food, even weighing the food. But in my experience, they're not always accurate. And I think it's very important to, uh, to be able to teach the patients early on what is the right amount of food. Sometimes I even have patients send me pictures of the, of the plates uh, to, to help them understand the portions. And many times by fixing those things or even your nutritionist, to do that can make a difference in, in how much reflux they may end up having uh, down the road. So uh, some some new few more slides from my practice. This is this is a, a this diagram show three different techniques I use in my practice since I started doing sleeves. And originally I was doing the classic technique with the 30, a, a 30 difference bougie and only 60 millimeter loads. And this is the uh, the green bars that you can see on both diagrams. And then the technique the second technique goes 
the same technique with the bougie and the 60 millimeter loss, but then I added the gastroflexy. And then lastly, I started using uh, no bougie. I did the gastroflexy routinely and I started in, in, utilizing also some 45 millimeter loads uh, as necessary, depending on the stomach geometry. And you can see that the first uh, diagram on the left of the slide shows you the difference between the pre-operative and post-operative GERD score. We use a, a valid instrument and all our patients uh, fill that questionnaire before surgery and after surgery uh, every six months. And you can see that uh, with the change of techniques progressively, uh, the improvement uh, significantly uh, 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 increased to the benefit of the last technique of using no bougie, gastropexy, and a combination of 45 and 60 millimeter loads. And also on the, on the uh, right part of the slide, the de novo instance of reflux has significantly reduced with the last technique. So again, uh, I can make a conclusion because of my personal experience, but I think there is some value to consider those elements, uh, especially, at least in some of the, of the more challenging cases you do. Uh, also, if I take, uh, interestingly, I also assess the instance of reflux of patients that had a sleeve elsewhere and they came to my practice for follow-up or for revision compared to the uh, reflux that my, reflux cause of my patients for the same level of follow-up. And interestingly, there's significant difference in those. Again, the, the, the groups are not totally comparable because I get a fraction of the patients from other practice, probably patients that were not very happy with the follow-up or the results, so they might not be exactly equally uh, equal groups, but they definitely there is significant difference in the reflux course. So that's another point to make. Lastly, I want to mention that despite the fact that I don't use the bougie, and my uh, my caliber of the sleeve might be light, slightly bigger than other other practices not using the bougie, uh, our weight loss overall has been uh, great. Uh, the one year weight loss, total body weight loss is 29.33% average for the sleeves. Uh, about 30% of our patients achieve a BMI below 26 by first year of the surgery and over 50% have a BMI below 30. And I believe that's very good results to have. And if you can combine that with the, a low instance of reflux, I believe that makes the sleeve even more appealing than this, than this nowadays because, you know, uh, no one can argue with the fact that it's an easy procedure to perform, but the, the problem with the reflux uh, has been an issue. And, and, and sometimes uh, makes surgeons skeptical to uh, use this procedure, especially with, with people or patients have reflex uh, preoperatively. So in conclusion, um, I have a very positive experience using the Eon staples for over two years. Um, and, I, and I do agree with all the previous speakers that there's definitely an obvious difference in the instance of bleeding. Um, I believe uh, technique does play a role in uh, the instance of the novel reflex. And there are some points that you have to keep in mind. Uh, hiatal hernia repairs, I think, are important. Um, and, I, and I'm strongly advocate of a uh, circumferential dissection, posterior and anterior repair. That's another important issue that is not always defined in studies that how the repair was performed. And many times, repair was only anterior. I don't believe that is an adequate hiatal hernia repair. And I think that makes it much more likely for the, for the hernia to repair and for the symptoms to repair. So if you want to fix the hernia, I would recommend a complete dissection to confine the limb the and and, 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 and no close posterior and anterior the crura. Another issue that I have seen recently and I've been thinking about is you know what do you do for patients that you know they have they have been reporting reflux preoperatively or they have a high reflux score or you have an upper GI that shows reflux there's no hernia but you go in and you see that weak hiat hiatus you know you don't see the, anat the area anatomically clear you know the fat pad is kind of stuck to the to the uh, diaphragm, you know, you, you have to separate to really see where the actual hiatus is. And to me, I think that's probably the first step of a hiatal hernia. And the question is, do you leave that or you fix it? Uh, especially again, on patients have reflux, you know, I don't have an answer to, for that, but I think it's something I, I try to keep track now and see how this correlates with uh, patients' outcomes uh, post-operatively. Uh, I believe it does make a difference if you do longer resections. Um, I, I definitely find a difference. And, and I think look at your pathology reports and see what your length of specimens are and what your maximum width of specimens are and see if you can correlate that with patient symptoms uh, afterwards. Uh, Gastropexy should be considered, at least in some cases. Uh, Boozy doesn't guarantee, guarantee a good sleep, as you all know, and doesn't guarantee elimination of reflux post-operatively. 
Uh, age by law should be looked at preoperatively and be treated. And, and for patients have persistent age by law, is something that we probably need to uh, address post as well. And shouldn't let it be because it does associate with uh, esophagitis and barrets. And, and lastly, don't forget the patient and don't forget the education component that we are responsible for uh, to help the patient understand how they should be uh, functioning, how to be eating and drinking to, uh, to do their part to reduce the of weight loss. Thank you very much for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you for that talk. It's, you know, I've been at this for 14 years and uh, the, the irony that of the sleeve, I mean, I feel like we are repeating history again of the lap band and the goalposts just keep moving. Because, you know, with the band, it was, well, this is a low volume, high pressure band. And then the study would come out and say it doesn't work. And then it was a high volume, you know, high pressure band. And they keep changing this stuff. And now with the sleeves, it was a 60 French bougie. Then it was a 32 French bougie. Then it was a 40 French bougie. Now we're to no bougie. And it's still causing reflux. And they used to say that about the band too. Oh, you got to aggressively fix the hiatal hernia. You have to aggressively fix it. And we're still here and we're still doing sleeves and, you know, it's our most common revised procedure. And I want to get in there every time there's a sleeve and go, okay, this patient is three years out, classic, gained all their weight back because they all lose weight initially. I mean, I'll, I'll grant you that, but the long-term weight regain is so high. And then you get in there and, you know, it's tempting for us to say, oh, well, that surgeon just didn't do it right. But then you get in there and you look at it and you're like, well, the sleeve looks just like a sleeve. It just doesn't work because they forgot to do the other part of the procedure, which is the duodenal switch. And so that's just my comment is that I really feel like we are replaying the lap band history all over again, where the goalposts just keep shifting every two or three years to try something different. Do you have any comment on that? I mean, it's a, it's a valid point. Uh, I don't think that the sleeve um, is the lab band. And I personally, um, I, I did practice throughout the lab band era and I have done very few lab bands. Uh, I knew from the beginning that fundamentally this procedure would never be uh, successful. Um, and I'm glad I didn't. I think the sleeve, I, I, was, I did not adapt the sleeve early on. Uh, I was doing bypasses and I kept doing bypasses uh, for, for several years when the sleeve was becoming the number one procedure. So I'm not gonna say I'm a, I'm a sleeve advocate. I was very skeptical about the sleeve and the primary reason I was skeptical was the, the reflux and the potential weight regain, which I'd seen also because I, was, I did my training in UPMC. I walked back a shower. I, was, I have seen sleeves way before even was uh, allowed by insurances. And I've seen patients and I followed patients from him I had this leave, uh, you know, a <laughs> lot 2010 uh, and much before that. So, uh, and I wasn't very happy with the results. So it is also easy to, to say, well, uh, let's become more aggressive and let's do more aggressive things. And I was a, a very, uh, you know, strong advocate of the bypass, but as the bypass has also the do with and I'm not saying, these are, they are great procedures, <laughs> but they have, the high risk of problems. Uh, and who doesn't have patients? I, I don't do switches, but I'm not, I have nothing against it. Uh, but bypasses, who wants to have the patients with a persistent ulcer uh, that has persistently bothering you, bleeding, perforating, redo, more ulcers, or having to do complex revisions? Uh, it's a nightmare. Uh, you, have, you get three, four of those over the years you're doing it, you know, and then you're just losing any kind of interest in in fact, they do that, it's almost PTSD. So there are risks of, of getting down the road of more complex stuff. There's no question that the more complex the operation is, the more likely the patient will lose weight or, or, remain, or retain the weight. But I also believe that we're not doing a very good job in general in preparing the patient for surgery and, and helping the patients and supporting the patient after surgery. We're just doing the surgical part and the rest are not as good. And you're trying to treat a, treat a, a problem that yeah, is that's happening true. for years, and you just expect to treat with an operation. It's not, it's that, not going that's, to work. There's, there's no doubt that uh, education plays a point. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Billy, what do you have to say? Yeah, I think my role with the sleeve is that I think it, it's successful enough that it shows me who needs more surgery. Um, the fastest part 
of practice of mine that's growing is the gastric bypass who's regained all their weight seven to 10 years after surgery, which I think poses a much more challenging problem than a sleeve that failed to reach their goals. I like the opportunity to know how a patient did over three to four years after their sleeve to make the determination whether we need a DS or whether we need a bypass for that patient. So I'm not opposed to accepting the reality that the sleeve is not the world's best long-term weight loss operation. I think reflux is a separate problem with the sleeve than successive surgery. And I think we have more modalities now. <clears throat> we have Lynx devices, which work well, and we've been using them for the lower BMI, the more successful patients. Um, and so as the time goes by, I think we're going to put each procedure into the proper you know, basket, you know, so to speak, that where we can try to pick the right operation for the patient. I think if we fail with a sleeve to achieve weight loss goals, it's not that we picked the wrong operation. We learned more about the patient. I think if we pick a bypass and they regain all their weight, maybe there was more in the after work that could have been done. Maybe the operation was the wrong one, but it's far more difficult to change them to a DS, which is probably what they needed uh, from the very beginning. Yeah, those are, I mean, those are some good points. However, if you take into consideration so many different employers and insurance companies are limiting patients to one lifetime procedure and that the links isn't covered in both states, then um, it does pose the reflux in those patients is problematic because, you know, the sleeve was a one lifetime procedure. Now they have reflux and they need a gastric bypass. So interesting dilemmas, but I don't disagree that it is a fork in the road for you to choose something different. Dr. Chalk, what's your stance? Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I think that we need to change our approach to, to surgery and our views on the patients and obesity is a chronic disease. Um, and so if you start with one operation and three, five, 10 years later, they need another it's, it's just something that is part of the disease process. You know, vascular surgeons don't start with a um, BKA, right? They start with the, the toe gangrene and the, ampu um, the toe amputation and go to a fem pop and then a fem fem. I mean, there's just a continuum of care. Um, and this is a chronic disease and some patients are fixed with one operation and others will require additional ongoing care. And so we need to kind of approach it like that, I think. The, and problem, the, the problem with the chronic disease argument, if you're an employer and insurer, is what's the point of covering it to begin with? And I know on the West Coast, it may be a little bit different with everybody covering it. But for instance, here in, in the middle of the country, even Obamacare doesn't cover weight loss surgery. So that's the chronic disease argument actually is what they use against us when it comes to not covering weight loss surgery. Like what's the point if it's just gonna continue to happen? Now, somehow we've gotten ourselves in that situation because your point with vascular surgery, on oncologic surgery is very valid. Like we're just held to a different standard um, than any other surgical specialty. You can't show a return on investment on a hip replacement or a knee replacement. I agree with um, that. That's so associated with obesity that still exists. Um, right. You know, we just have to keep forward and fighting that. I did have a question um, for Dr. Raftopoulos, sorry, uh, about your gastropexy. And can you describe in a little bit more detail how you or where you place that? Yes. Um, usually I place uh, between four and six interrupted uh, sutures. I start from the uh, angle of his, um, and I take small cerebral muscular bites just above the strip line, and I usually attach them ideally back to the area of the dissection at the sorgastics. Now, obviously, you have to be careful because you know there are vessels there, so you have to kind of the vessels you previously ligated, so you have to kind of you know go in between where there is a you know um, uh, an area that there's a vascular areas between the, the vessels and try to attach that. If I have difficulty doing that or sometimes there's no much laxity. And if you start pulling that part of the omentum, you're basically pulling the spleen with you, especially in the upper part of the, of the gastropexy, then I may use part of the fat of the omentum to do it. But most of the times I'm able to, to place the sutures exactly at the previous area of, uh, of ligation of the sorgastic vessels. Uh, they use, I use uh, absorbable sutures. I use the uh, endoscope device to, to, to place them. 
And I also make an effort, you know, as you have noticed when you, when you finish the strip line and you look at it, sometimes you see there are areas in the strip line that kind of uh, uh, indentations that they kind of uh, fold, you know, the strip line kind of goes into the lumen of the stomach. So I try to find those areas and, and try to put the suture there and kind of straighten, straighten them out basically and put the stomach back exactly as you would like it to be like a, like a straight tube uh, all the way down to the pylorus. Uh, and I also try to follow the angles of the stomach. Uh, so the suits are not exactly in the same place, but you know they have they depend uh, on exactly the location, the anatomy of the stomach. But that's how I do it, uh, and, and it works well. It's, it's, it takes me about you know five seven minutes to do this. It's not like a, a significant you know uh, extra time in the OR, and I, and I and I and I believe it does make a difference. It may not make a difference in every case I do, uh, but at the same time I also I'm in, in favor of if you're trying to implement something, if you're not doing it often you're not gonna do it when you need it. So you have to really practice. So when the time is actually necessary to do it, you are com comfortable enough to do it quickly. All right, those are excellent points. Well, we're at that uh, 10.30, well, I'm Mountain Standard Time. Uh, at the end of this conference, I'd like to again, thank uh, the IBC and um, uh, for having, and Oxford University for having this and great job on the presentations, guys. It was, uh, vast array of topics and I'd like to say thank you to the moderators as well for chiming in it was a pleasure to uh, do this with y'all and I hope you guys uh, anybody that's tuned in has learned a lot about the Lexington stapler and uh, may give it a go that said we'll we'll call it a day everybody have a great rest of your day thank you thank you Josh. Thank you. Oxford University hot topics and surgery production I want to thank my co-chair, our moderators, and our distinguished panel of experts for their valuable time and talent today. We want to acknowledge all our partners and sponsors as our global collaboration produces safer and better outcomes. Register to obtain CME credits for this and upcoming events at cine-med.com forward slash IBC 2021. To view the complete Hot Topics and Surgery series, subscribe to our IBC YouTube channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Mark your calendars as the third IBC Oxford University Congress is being held September 19th through the 21 of 2022. For more information, go to ibccongress.org. And now let's view another brief episode of IBC's exclusive Spotlight on Industry and today's sponsor. From IBC Global, stay safe and God bless. I've been a bariatric surgeon uh, since 1999. And over the last 20 years, it's grown uh, to where 80% of my practice is now bariatric, revisional, reversal. And so we meticulously examined staple lines. We obviously compared outcomes, but you have to do well, thousands of cases to see a, a leak rate. And we compared them. We would do one case with a new stapler, next case with an older stapler. We started to see outcomes that were not only acceptable, but on par. So it was important to me to meet the people that brought this to market. We were invited to the, to the corporate headquarters in Boston. Uh, not only are they designed there, but they're manufactured there, they're packaged there. Quality control is it's something I've never seen before. And so this company has allowed us to have actually more articulation than the competing platforms have. And you can position the articulation wherever you want. And more importantly, it stays there. One of the things I like is that it's ergonomic and it is in a design that we're all familiar with. Uh, you can control the rotation with one hand if you like. The buttons that accentuate the stapler being ready to fire are available on both sides. And we have this slow mode, fast mode that lets the surgeon design exactly how they want this stapler to be, be fired. La única que yo conozco que tiene dos modos de corte. Uno es estándar y el otro es grueso. Ellos le ponen aquí estándar y thick. Tú sientes una suavidad a la hora de estar haciendo el disparo. Sentir en mi mano qué es lo que estoy cortando. Y en este tipo de rapadora, cuando tú la pones en thick o en modo easy, se va de una manera muy suave. 
hemos tenido la oportunidad, pues gracias a Dios hasta el momento, más de 100 casos, no hemos tenido fugas, no hemos tenido sangrados. So exchanging this out does not require big re-education of your operating room staff. As more cartridge colors came out, we have an array of five, six different types of cartridges that allow us to go from quite thick black all the way down to vascular loads. As our case volume changed, as we started to do more complicated operations, we really depended on having more choice than one company would have over another. So you have confidence, you have ergonomics, you have familiarity. Very, very easy to incorporate this into a standard practice that currently is using staplers of the mechanical variety. Uh, so design innovation and achieving what surgeons are asking for is happening on a monthly basis. So I'm very, very happy with those unique features that have taken what we've all worked with for 20 years and brought them to a different level.